Hi folks, I'm uh, pretty excited because I have just received a present. Um, my present has come from Kali Masil. Um, as you guys who've followed me for a while know, I really love Kali Masil stuff. They do um, really high quality foam weapons, which I use for HEMA um, and other training. So I'm pretty excited because they have sent me something for my birthday. I'm very excited about this. Um, so, uh, for the longest time, um, I just want to talk through... Hey guys, thanks for joining. Um, can you guys hear me alright? Just doing a sound check. Um, just waiting. Hi guys, thanks for joining. Um, so, I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited, just to start from the top, um, Kelly Masol have sent me something for my birthday. Um, it is long and comes in a box. <laughs> so, um, for you guys who've been following me for a while, you'll know that um, I really love Kelly Masol's stuff. They do high quality um, foam foam weapons that move and function roughly about the way that I want to be able to work um, and do HEMA. Um, so up until now, my favorite, um, my favorite long swords of theirs um, actually surprisingly has been the Highlander, mostly because it's another reason it's good to use synthetic weapons inside. Um, <laughs> So uh, I really like the, um, the Highlander because of the, the length of the pommel. I can do a lot of uh, two-handed sword work that um, their other weapons don't really allow for. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the Claymore style um, aesthetically, but this, uh, for the longest time, has been really, really good um, for me. And I've, I've been using, using this one for years. It stood up really well. It's in excellent condition. And it is just about to be superseded because I got a present. Um, I know what it is. Um, I'm very excited about it. <coughs> but with no further ado, I'm going to be uh, opening it. So, just to give you an idea of how big this thing is, uh, it, it's, it's quite large. Um, yes. <laughs> yes, I just, I just squeaked. I totally squeaked. And I am proud of it. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness, that's so shiny! Oh my goodness, you guys! Whoops, I just deal with this. It's like the shortest unboxing video ever. <laughs> oh, 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 it's so beautiful! Oh my gosh, you guys! Oh, hang on a sec. This is um, Radzig's sword. It is from the game Kingdom Come Deliverance, um, put out by Warhouse Games. It's so nice. Um, it is set during in Bohemia during the um, uh, early fifteenth century, fourteen o three. The game has been has been praised as being extremely historical. <sighs> this comes directly from the game. They uh, have been working with Kali Masil to produce um, extremely lovely, <laughs> extremely lovely replicas from the game. And this one has been specially weighted for me. The pommel, um, the pommel is heavier, so. Oh my gosh, I'm 
trying to I'm trying to show the the way that the the pommel feels. So that's a natural pendulum going on right now. Oh my gosh. Um I do not remember seeing this color pattern on the ones in the store. I have a feeling they've painted it special for me. I am extremely happy right now. <laughs> Kelly Massol, thank you guys. Thank you to the team, the amazing team who produced these gorgeous weapons. I've had the, the pleasure of going to the workshop a few times. Um, and this, this is actually a thank you for um, me teaching at the workshop um, uh, for the open day um, at the end of last year. Um, so, look at this. It's so flipping beautiful. Um, for you sword nerds who are interested in the specs, um, the total length is 118 centimeters. Um, no, I'm not converting it to inches. You guys are smart. You couldn't find out. Um, so 118 centimeters. Um, the blade itself is 93 centimeters. Um, the thickness is two centimeters. Um, the handle is 27 centimeters, the grip is 18 centimeters, and the cross guard is 23.5. Um, and if you find yourself coveting such an item, it is $185 Canadian from Kelly Massol. Um, you can also get them refurbished for $140. So, I got a sword. Oh my god, it's so nice. It's just just wants to do things. Oh, it's like, I haven't actually, I haven't handled it with the, um, with the balance before, like even before they put in, even before they put in the, the balancing, it already was a beautiful sword. The only problem is it's so beautiful I don't think I want to use it. <laughs> because they do tend to get pretty beat up in my care. Um, although that said, I mean, this, this one is like three, three years old and it's still doing pretty well. So, so side by side comparison. Um, as I told you guys, this one was my favorite um, and probably will be for a while still um, for two handed sword work, just because of the, the, um, the length down the weapon when I can, I can really get a lot of leverage. Um, uh, from the, the length of the, the handle. Um, so the other one is, is definitely shorter. Um, but the blades, the blades are the same length. Um, obviously this one is a unique one for the game that was, um, that was made, but they've used the same blade profile. I think? No, they haven't. Sorry. It's a, it's a different one. It's a later design. Um, yeah, they've actually, if you look at it from the end, um, you can actually see it has this beautiful curve in. Um, so it's reducing weight on the, on the blade, just as you would with a, a steel weapon. Um, whereas this one, this one doesn't have quite that, that, uh, that same divot. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty delighted about this. Um, this is not the only sword that Kelly Missile gifted me, um, as a thank you for the workshop that I ran for them. Uh, this was the other sword that they gave me. Um, this one is a single hander. It's absolutely gorgeous. It is, um, also from Kingdom Come. And it's, uh, it's Henry's sword. Um, I've not played the game. I want to, um, I've been a little busy, but um, I, uh, <laughs> I am in love with the weapons. Um, I have a friend who pl who's played the game and he said it's really fun. Um, it's like a role playing game, but um, it's not fantasy, it's all medieval. <laughs> so these are the two, two beautiful, beautiful swords. Thank you so much to Kelly Missile um, for giving them to me. Um, I will be sharing photos. So, uh, if you guys have any questions, now's the time. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna wrap up this somewhat short live stream. Um, thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. Oh my God. It's just, it's just so nice. It 
just wants to move. Like, there is the tiniest, tiniest amount of power to make that pivot. I'm trying really hard to do this in a tiny space. Look at that. Look at that weight. The counterbalance. Um, I don't know if I'll be coming back to Hero Roundtable. Um, I've been talking to Matt about it. Uh, it is something that I'd like to do in the future, but uh, for the next one I'm not going to be there, I'm sorry. I keep hitting my light bulb. <laughs> mm. It's just... It's just lovely. Look at the detail. So gorgeous. Yes, both. Um, so I actually use um, I use Kelly Missile weapons for Hemo. Um, I practice Hemo without uh, protection, um, but I use the most basic protection, which is of course safety glasses and um, depending on the speed I'm working, mouth guard, hand protection sometimes. Um, but I really um, I really value working with foams because I started with steel and I started with um, heavier weapons. Um, than foam as training weapons and um, so I'm able to bring the tactile understanding of how, how steel works to working with foam. Um, I really always recommend working um, with multiple tools especially for something like swordsmanship because um, there is no single one tool that can truly simulate the way that a sharp steel sword works except for a sharp steel sword which of course you can't use in training because you're never going to get um, you're never going to get everything working at the same intensity, or um, uh, you're not going to be able to work with a sharp steel sword safely with an opponent in the way that they used to. You have to use m lots and lots of different tools to understand the circumstances that swords were used in. So for me, um, for the last few years, my focus and interest um, as a more experienced martial artist has been um, moving freely. Um, without protective gear and I do not recommend that for people just starting out. Um, I definitely recommend working with protective gear until you have um, people that you trust that you can work with um, and you have a degree of control um, for yourself that you know how to train safely. Um, so the protection is ultimately there to keep you safe but if you have control you can also keep yourself safe um, and you have a partner you're working with. So for me that's where I'm at and for me these tools are excellent um, for what I want to achieve in my historical European martial arts training. Um, I do also uh, take these to lapping but um, because the sports game that I'm uh, that I'm doing is um, is Bikulin and it's mass mass battles um, I'm definitely not using my Kali missiles in that environment. I'm actually a spear fighter. I, I fight with a nine foot long um, spear, um, primarily and singularly. I don't actually use any other weapon at Biko. Um, and obviously if I lose my spear, I use a dagger, but then <laughs> I'm not really very useful to the uh, 400 people that I'm fighting with. Um, so yeah, do I use these for lapping? Mm, when I'm off the field, um, these are mostly mostly for character, um, mostly for um, photographic opportunities, I mean they're beautiful, and uh, also for the, the work that I do, um, obviously modelling and everything, I, I will use these. Um, I used to model with heavier stuff, but uh, because, because you're sustaining your body for an extended period of time, obviously it makes sense to use something lighter, so actually the Kali's are really, really good for that too. So all of those reasons, um, kind of had me working more and more with Kelly Missil, um, and uh, I, I just love their stuff. And it's um, it's definitely uh, it's definitely been a pleasure to be able to go to the workshop and see how they build these things, because with my background as a special effects technician and a prop maker, um, I can look at the way that they built things and understand exactly how the process goes. Um, and I still maintain that they, outside of the film industry, are the most, um, the, the highest level um, of commercially available swords that I've seen. Um, so yeah, that's why, 
I really love Cali Marcel. Um, also, they're here in Quebec, they're a local company. Um, yay, yay Canada. <laughs> All right, you guys, um, thanks so much for uh, uh, checking in. Oh, one more question. Isn't motion too different? I mean balance, I've never used a foam weapon. Great question, Kat. Um, so, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, working with foam is very different to working with steel. Um, there, um, there is a tensile strength in steel that is, um, it gives you a certain amount of responsivity and feedback. Um, so when you touch something with steel, if the, if the metal's good, you can actually feel um, and get a lot of feedback from the way that it engages with an object, especially if it's a sharp weapon. Um, the problem is that for HEMA, um, most of us need to use blunt weapons because we don't have training partners who are comfortable working with sharp swords. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a club, um, a martial arts club that was, um, but again, we, we had to train for that. We had to be very, very careful. And when I was training with them, I was not at that level. I was still fairly, uh, fairly inexperienced. Um, but I did see the, the ways that my masters approached that and I was able to adopt those, those training practices for myself. Um, most HEMA people don't consider foam for a few reasons. Um, one is there's not very good publicity about um, tools such as what Cali Missile offer. Um, for some reason, the people, the people in the community have not had a chance to handle them or really use them. Um, whereas I've seen almost identical equivalents in the Eastern martial arts community um, weapon-wise, that are happily adopted throughout Eastern martial arts. So people are working with foam weapons and, and rubber weapons um, for weapons training, which, of course, you're striking each other with strength. Like, you want to be able to use something that you're not going to take someone out um, with an injury. Um, and it is still possible with, with foam. It's totally possible to cause injury with foam, um, especially if you're not, um, if you're not aware of, of uh, where you're striking or how much energy you're putting into it. Um, so I tend to treat foam just as I would a steel sword. I, I endeavour to do that, um, both in care, handling, and also um, the power that I use when I'm striking, because I don't want to be, I don't want to be training twice. I want to be training once. Um, it's just that working with foam, there's there's differences. Um, it construction-wise, um, the core of the biggest problem that I have with um, foam weapons, especially the ones that are on the lot market, is that the foam, uh, the foam is surrounding a core that is circular. Um, that might not sound like a big deal, but a circular cross section behaves very differently to a flat cross, cross section. So when you put power into a cut or something, um, if you've got a rounded shape, um, and that interacts with something else, it's going to behave differently to if it was a rectangular shape, um, and m it might not seem like a big difference, but um, the physics behind it do actually count for something. So the biggest, the biggest difference that I've noticed with, um, with foam weapons um, is that some things that should work don't work. Um, you have to adapt for that and it can, if, you, if you're not also training with other stuff, it can uh, lead to bad, bad habits. Um, second, thing, second thing about foam um, is it's got a wider, it's got a wider blade profile. Um, now this is common in, in, um, in HEMA to have wider blunt weapons, so this is not that unusual. It's a little wider than, than what you see with um, like the rolling synthetics or the, the other nylon weapons um, out there. Um, it's, it's just a wee bit wider, um, which some people might be a bit mm, not happy about, but I still find it workable. So um, the, tip, the tip is, this has come a long way since the early Kellys. Um, this used to be very rounded. And that was mostly because they were appealing to a LARP market, and LARPers didn't want to have something that was remotely sharp coming towards them. Um, since a lot of LARPers are not swords, swords people, they're, they're not trained in swordsmanship. So um, in a lot of LARPs, they don't allow thrusting um, for safety reasons, which I totally respect. Um, it's just that in actual swordsmanship, thrusting is probably about 80% of what you're going to be doing with a long, sharp, stabby thing. Um, so... <laughs> Um, it's really nice to see that these these are now offered with with slightly sharper um, uh, tip um, shapes. Um, other other differences with foam. So one of the things I really do enjoy um, about working with foam versus other um, synthetic wasters is the fact that foam will, will bite in a bind. So 
when you um, this is something that I talk about a lot and it's it's really really vital to understanding swordsmanship is when you um, have two swords that are intersecting um, they create a bind and if you have a soft slippery weapon you're not going to have any purchase it's going to be slipping and sliding all around the way um, so that's what happens when you have a blunt weapon is it's, it's very soft and slippery if you have a sharp weapon it's going to bite because that's how blades cut is they have little teeth and so um, the little tiny teeth bite into each other and you actually get something that forms a kind of a lock for a moment um, which is just enough time to be able to feel where your opponent is um, and respond to that and also just feel the force going through the, the two weapons um, and this is a vital concept for all martial arts um, is the fact that when you bind with someone you can feel the pressure um, and you can adjust to it and respond to it and that's missing from probably most of the swordsmanship that you see in movies or even in, in, in HEMA clubs because a lot of people are not training for the bind and the bind is, is totally, totally vital um, for um, medieval martial arts and uh, you're going to see it in, in books um, from from the um, from the medieval period, so all of these guys are in contact with each other, right? And they're using that contact. They're using the force that's going into each other to manipulate the other one. Um, it's it's like working with what you have, rather than just trying to trying to stab the other person faster and it being a race. Um, you actually you actually need to work with what you've given um, kind of a bit like rock climbing um, if anyone's ever done rock climbing or uh, I don't know mm, it's probably a bit of an extreme example but anyway um, so with rock climbing you want to be using the contact point to get to the next contact point um, so same in swordsmanship if you have or martial arts in general if you have a contact point on someone you're going to use it to push off to a different position which is preferably going to advantage you and not your opponent. So that is one of the things that I really do love about working with foams is the fact that um, because they have a seam line going along the blade um, exactly where the where the uh, the tooth of the the blade would be on a sharp weapon um, it gives it much more much more tack and grip than, it, than you find on other other uh, weapons and it's just enough that if you're training with someone who is um, who is sensitive as a swords fighter um, and and uh, responsive you can get some really um, really advanced swordsmanship going on um, now majority of the people out there are just kind of baseball batting with swords um, which I have no comment on um, but I, uh, I still say that working with foams is a really great asset to learning swordsmanship. Um, also, the other reason I adopted them is because um, I'm often working with beginners, and the confidence level for someone working with a foam weapon is a lot higher than if you hand them something a little heavier, or you know, heaven forbid, a steel sword um, in their first like five lessons, um, because people know that steel can hurt you. Um, and so it's going to, I mean, I do, I do definitely advocate for people to handle steel weapons as soon as possible, but um, when it comes to actual training and drills, um, yeah, I swear by these things. <laughs> so that's me. Um, I could go on about this for a while longer. Um, if you have any more questions, uh, this was meant to be an unboxing video. So thanks for tuning in. Um, and thanks again to Kelly Massil for... Uh, the awesome birthday gift slash thank you for the workshop so pretty I'll just show you guys again I don't know what they put in this but it's really really solid feels like metal I do have a magnet somewhere I could find out so nice they've done this for me special So you notice when I'm handling it, I'm not touching the edges because I'm holding it with a steel weapon in mind, uh, a sharp weapon in mind. So shiny.
So once again, for you guys who tuned in, this is uh, Radzig's Sword. So Radzig's Sword from Kingdom Come Deliverance, um, made by Warhouse Games and oh, Warhouse War Horse Studios. Sorry, Warhouse Studios, um, and it is produced, uh, built and produced by Calamusil. Um, and this was a very lovely gift from them to me. So thank you guys. Is it a long sword? Well, it's not a short sword. <laughs> um, yes, it is a long sword. Uh, long swords, long swords are a recent term um, used to describe two-handed swords. In the medieval period, this would have been just called a two-handed sword. Um, it is. Uh, it's only recently that we started giving them special categorizations and names. Um, bastard sword is also another recent invention. Um, Medieval people would not have called this a bastard sword. Um, this is not a bastard sword. Oh, is it a bastard sword? It's a really good point. A bastard sword is a sword that technically you can use with one or two hands, um, which is, it's neither one nor the other. A two-handed sword is one that can only be used with two hands. So this would be a two-handed sword. Because even though I can take my hand off and use it properly, it benefits from the extended um, uh, leverage. Um, like I can't, I can't get good control with just one hand. Again, this is why I use synthetics, because I've hit that light bulb now maybe seven times, <laughs> gently. Uh, it's not why I use synthetics; it's just an added bonus. Um, so yeah, this is still a long sword. Um, this would be a single-handed sword. However, at the time, this would have been called an arming sword. Um, now, since we're talking swords, um, one thing you'll notice about this is how long the grip is. Um, this is this is larger than it would have been, and the reason is because it needs to accommodate a modern um, armored an armored person's hand going on this. So. <laughs> um, I'm getting distracted by y'all's comments. <laughs> um, so one of the things that Kali Missile will do is they'll make their um, the grips longer. And actually, a, basically anyone who's supplying modern um, the modern medieval market, um, and it could be for Battle of Nations as well. Um, basically, anyone who's fighting with a, a gauntlet on their hand um, tends to want a larger sword so they can grip it. Now historically, historically they were not making the sword grip so long. And I know this because I've seen them in the museums, and I've studied this for many years. Um, so the the uh, the sizing of a sword, it should be as small and comfortable as possible. Um, swords were not big and brutish. They um, they were certainly they were certainly effective at the size that they were. Um, they didn't need to be any bigger than they 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 had to, because um, obviously the bigger that something is, like if you're working with a tool and it's unnecessarily large, you're going to be slower. Um, in a, if you're in a fight, you're not going to be, um, you're not going to be as responsive as your opponent, and that could mean the difference between life or death. So, everything to do with weaponry in the medieval period and you know the period surrounding that is um, is as ergonomically designed as possible. Um, and every extra bit of metal that doesn't need to be there was designed to be to be rid. Um, from from the weapon to make it as light as possible. Um, same with armor. Everything was just basically as streamlined as po as their technology permitted, and was constantly being up upgraded throughout the medieval period. Like the entire <laughs> the entire medieval period was basically one big arms race of people developing weapons and then developing protection against those weapons and then better weapons and you know and so on and so forth until gunpowder came along and no one was wearing any armor anymore because it was pointless. Um, so. <laughs> Hi, Samantha Swords. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> I uh, love talking about this stuff. Um, if you have any more questions, now's the time. Um, I will be taking an adult beverage off screen. Mm. You don't want to look at me. You want to look at the swords. Shiny. 
I'm certain this is a custom paint job. Um, I definitely did not see this on the other one that I looked at. <laughs> and from the end. It's totally my pleasure. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. I am absolutely delighted. Um, I look very much forward to starting to use this. Um, didn't advances in metallurgy help that arms race along? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the So, that is true. Um, but actually, the um, uh, advances in trading helped it more because um, what ended up happening was people were able to outsource. So much like um, much like today when we get, you know, every single item that's made right now has about 26 different points of origin. There's no such thing as made in China or made in USA. It's actually every item and component comes from the huge web of other places that have produced those things um, and sent them those components um, that are assembled for as, as cheap as possible. And the same thing happened in the, midi in the Middle Ages, especially towards the end of the Middle Ages. Um, so you had great big workshops in Milan, for example, um, and Germany. You had places that were producing just blades, and they would send barrels of bl blades over, say, to England um, that were made in um, a totally different place. And then those, those blades would be assembled and fitted by local smiths. Um, and so in, in that way, it wasn't just the the advances in metallurgy that um, that helped. It was actually the fact that there was better organization. There was outsourcing. There were factories, literal factories, um, producing we weapon components that were just bought and traded. Um, exactly how it's done today. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's certainly true of the very early medieval period. Um, so you know the time before um, before everything was stable enough to be sending barrels of weapons across country. Um, it, it was true that, that people um, did depend on local talent and mo local um, resources and um, to be producing better and better weapons. Um, but even then, even in the 700s, 800s, people were definitely trading. Um, you, see, you see evidence of um, things going from as, as far as Byzantium to Ireland. Uh, so, like, as long as humans have been tra uh, able to trade things, they have been. Um, especially when it's something to do with weaponry. So that's that's really my answer to that would be it's not so much the advances in metallurgy that made a difference um, to the weapon quality, it's the fact that they could have specialist workshops producing stuff mass-produced mass produced, um, for relatively low cost. I'm sorry that the answer is not more romantic than that. It was forged in the fires of Avalon and spat on by fairies and wafted over by wyverns. I'm sorry, what were you expecting me to say? <laughs> yes, that is exactly what happened. Mm, you can quote me. Alright guys, I'm out. Have a good, uh, have a good day or night or wherever it is on your side of the planet and um, I will see you guys on the internet.